Howdy, everybody. Well, let's keep going on this machine learning course. Now, we're just getting started when you really think about it. Don't worry if you're feeling a little bit impatient. We will have lecture upon lecture upon lecture with details and theory and applications of actual machine learning. But there's always prerequisites. We always have to start with the, we've already talked about the domain expertise. There's so much we could have covered about that. We've talked about the fundamental probability and statistics concepts that are prerequisite for everything we do with machine learning. It's statistical learning. And we talked about the whole coding or putting together workflows, workflow construction. Now let's talk about data preparation. Let's all have uh, three short lectures that will get into sampling limitations, declustering, and quantifying uncertainty. I think these are all essential parts of data preparation. But at the same time, I acknowledge that there's a lot more that we could talk about. In fact, we will have lectures afterwards on feature engineering and feature transformations. So we will be covering uh, quite a bit. Now, why do, we, why do we care about data preparation? Well, first and foremost, all machine learning methodologies do rely on data. And if you go and you talk to somebody working on a project right now and you ask them how much time or how much effort goes into preparing the data to get ready to build the model, you often hear an answer like 80, 90 percent. I visit a lot of companies and groups that have suggested that it might be even on the order of 90, 95 percent. So data preparation is, is an essential and large part of what we do when we're doing machine learning. Uh, the reason being is the old adage remains garbage in, garbage out. If you pay no attention to your data and you just go ahead and throw everything into the model, you're likely to not get a very reliable result. Our data is quite uncertain and we need to do something to address for to account for uncertainty and sampling bias. And so that's what we'll cover today. Now there are other, other resources available to you. These lectures right here will talk about fundamental issues around bias, sampling bias, and bootstrap, a methodology to get at uncertainty. Also, we cover the bootstrap because once we get into bagging as a methodology for ensemble machine learning modeling, we're going to need to be using bootstrap. And so we'll cover bootstrap right now. It's good we cover these prerequisites. Let's go ahead and get into sampling limitations and talk about what's going on in the subsurface. It's a very unique setting for sure. Our data in the subsurface is collected to answer questions. This is a fundamental difference between us and many other fields where we can design an experiment in a very careful, controlled manner. No, for us, the big questions we try to answer with data are things like, did the contaminant plume extend off the property. If it did, that's going to change things as far as reporting and so forth. And so we're going to be sampling not in a uniform or random manner. We'll be sampling peripheries, edges, trying to determine the extent of the contaminant plume. Where is the fault? We might have a large ceiling fault that goes through our subsurface reservoir. And we're going to drill based on seismic interpretation to establish where the fault is so we can get the edge of the reservoir and nail down our volumetrics. What's the highest mineral grade? We're going to sample the best part of the ore deposit. And so on and so forth. We're sampling to answer questions, to reduce uncertainties that are critical to the economic value. We are also sampling in a way that we maximize production rates from the subsurface. Every one of these is trying to maximize net present value of the subsurface operation. Well, why is this a concern? We should be thinking about representativity, right? Because if you're sampling, it's all about, for us on the statistics and data-driven approaches and machine learning methods, we're concerned with formulating a model, making predictions. We want representative statistics to do that. Well, why is it a concern around representativity? Why do we care around that? Let's take this example right here. We got y, x, map, view, We've got this area of interest that's just a very simple oval design. We've got wells one, two, three, four, up to seven. Are you concerned? If we were using those wells to assess the average porosity over this area of interest, 
would you be concerned with that? Well, if you look at it, it might be random sampling. I don't, maybe not. It's definitely not uniform or regular sampling. Hmm. Well, what if you knew this? What if you knew that this part of the reservoir was based on seismic mapping or some other information? We knew it was just better. Now we can realize very quickly that we are in fact sampling preferentially. We are sampling at a denser rate spatially for the high versus the low. Now what happens if we continue to sample in such a manner? Now we're drilling wells up from 7 to 11 wells and we have further densified our samples in the high area. Are you concerned now? What is happening to our measure of the average porosity? Well, we could track that over time. Number of wells drilled in the sequence they were drilled, and we could look at the average porosity we would assess just using naive statistics, the average of the sample. And if you looked at that, well, we drilled the first few wells were in the high area, but then we drilled some in the low area and start to balance out. But then we kept drilling high, kept drilling high, 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 and we would continually inflate our assessment of the naive average, the naive mean. We need to mitigate this because if we continue on with this, we will make predictions. The statistics we calculate from our sample data formulate predictive models, and we will make predictions away from the data that will be biased high. They're going to be too high. So how would we sample for representativity? Because that would be one thing we could do. We could design our sampling campaign with representativity in mind, and then we wouldn't have to deal with this issue of bias in the data, right? Well, if you go back to your original Statistics 101 course, you learn that representativity is possible through two different sampling methods. We've got random sampling and regular sampling. In random sampling, every single location, remember, the underlying population is a finite uh, countable set of possible samples, right? Every one of those samples, those potential samples, I should say, should have equal chance of being chosen. That's random sampling, true random sampling. Every location could just as likely be sampled as any other location. Is that ever possible? Hmm. Or what about regular sampling? When samples are taken at regular intervals, we drill every 100 meters. That's kind of com more common in a mining context that you might see regular sampling you know, if we're thinking about uh, very dense grade control surface mines and so forth. But it is less reliable than random sampling. The main issue would be what if there is cyclicity in the underlying population and the sample spacing resonates with that. We're sampling the troughs or the peaks systematically. That would create a bias, of course. Well, if we were sampling representatively, um, we would expect that we would have to do either random or regular sampling. Now just imagine, just kind of sit back and imagine, going into your boss's office if you worked for the, let's say, a business unit working in the Gulf of Mexico, and you said, I think we should drill the very next $150 million well at random. Nah, maybe you'd have to update your CV at that point, right? We know that that's not the best idea. It's the best idea is to continue on with the way we sample in a biased manner because it results in the best economics. It addresses fundamental questions, the big questions to understand the subsurface. So what do we do? We can't change the way we gather data. That's not going to happen. But what we can do is we can never use raw data without, first of all, being suspicious. We should suspect that there is bias in every subsurface data set that we work with. Now, if I haven't kind of been negative enough, let me kind of turn it up to 11 now, because there's bias upon bias. The wells are drilled preferentially in specific locations in order to answer those questions, maximize value. So the wells are preferentially located in an oil and gas setting. But then along the wells, we're then extracting core samples, as shown here. These are core samples right here preferentially from specific locations along the well themselves too. Then, along the core samples, we're extracting core plugs 
for our petrophysical analysis to assess the petrophysical properties, porosity, permeability, minerality, whatever it might be, grain size analysis. That's being done preferentially too. We don't pick locations along the core that are very low quality shale to send for that permeability analysis. It would take too long to run, it's expensive, we already know it's really bad. So we have bias upon bias, a hierarchy of three levels of bias going on right here. Now I want to moderate my statements just a little bit and make the comment that even if we weren't trying to drill in biased manner, we could still have limitations to our ability to have purely random representative sampling. We may have issues with accessibility of the subsurface. We have obstructions. We have constraints on, on the way that we can drill safe, reliable drilling trajectories in order to sample different locations within the subsurface. We have issues around some parts of the reservoir have poor illumination because of being subsalt or different geometries in the overburden. And we have issues with an inability to process certain samples. If we're going to run a reasonable permeability test, we may not be able to work with super low permeability rock. It just takes too long to run the test. Too expensive. So there are lots of different reasons that we may not be able to sample randomly because of constraints on the way we sample. Well, data are rarely collected for the statistical representativity. I would suggest probably almost never in most subsurface applications, specifically oil and gas and mining and so forth. Wells are drilled in areas with greatest probability of high production. Horizontal wells target specific stratigraphic layers with the highest pay. We're trying to land them in the right location. Cores are taken preferentially from good quality rock. These practices should not change. They result in the very best economics. So we're not going to fight against that. We have the most data in the most important locations to provide us with the best reduction in uncertainty and the best value to the project. Okay, so there's a need for us after the fact to deal with bias data. We need to adjust the distributions. We need to account for this bias in the sampling. We want the distributions to be representative of the entire volume of interest. That provides us with a good predictive model moving forward. How are we going to do that? Well, we have a variety of different methodologies. Actually, the first line of defense for spatial bias is good scientific engineering-based mapping. That's a wonderful thing to do. Once you've constructed reliable maps, you can take those maps and you can go ahead and calculate representative averages from those maps. You may not get the entire distribution. Maps don't tend to represent all of the variability, but you'll get a good measure of the central tendency that's more representative than the naive sample data. You can use regions. You can pool and use statistics only over specific regions so you're not mixing the high and the low area together like we showed before. That's very useful too. And you can use declustering techniques. Now we're going to have an entire lecture on declustering where we're going to explain how to do declustering and that I think that should be pretty helpful. Also you have debiasing techniques that actually formulate an entirely brand new distribution based on secondary information and a mapping of the relationship between the primary and secondary information. The criteria is the secondary information must be easier or must be exhaustively represented so you can use it. Okay, so let's give ourselves a very simple example. Let's illustrate some of those points I just made. Look at this example right here. The colors going from cold to hot colors are porosity from low to high porosity. Now if we're trying to go ahead and get the average porosity over this entire area right here, could we use the naive data to do that? Well, if you look at the data, they're clearly more densely sampled in the high porosity regions. That would be problematic. What can we do? We can work with regions. This is a great idea. We could say, well, this is low quality, medium quality, high quality, and we could pull the statistics within each one of the regions. That's probably a pretty good idea. That would be a big step in moving forward. In fact, this overall methodology of pooling by regions is done all the time 
in a methodology that's known as facies-based modeling. You use the statistics within the regi region only. You don't mix across the regions to avoid bias. Geologic mapping, I love that. I think geologic mapping is great. Think about it as a continuous set of regions where we've said, okay, high, high-ish, medium, medium-ish, low. You see you've got a smooth transition instead of the discrete transitions of the regions. If we build a map, the thing we can do with it immediately is you could integrate over the map and calculate the average over a map. Very easy to do. Discretization would be an easy way to do it. Once you have that, you have a representative average, and you could rescale the distribution with that new average. Very good workflow. Okay, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to finish this lecture. We've introduced the general issues around data preparation, representativity, and the idea of some basic map-based approaches and region-based approaches to be able to address spatial bias. These are all critical for data preparation in machine learning. We'll cover declustering and quantification of uncertainty in the next two recorded lectures. I hope this was helpful to you all. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm the Geostats guy on Twitter, YouTube, and GitHub. All of my lectures are recorded and available for anyone who's interested to learn about these topics, data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning. All right, I hope this was helpful to you. All right, take care.